Well, good morning, folks. Welcome to uh, week four of series we started a couple weeks ago called Viral, and uh, we're going to wrap that thing up today. I hope you had a great Thanksgiving holiday, and uh, you know the camera adds 10 pounds, so that is the camera that you're seeing for my extra weight, not what I ate this past week, or it could be a combination of both. Regardless, also, I don't know if you know this or not, Caswell folks, but the camera also adds 10 pounds the opposite direction, so you look 10 pounds heavier to me as well right now. Um, I know I see you checking it out there on the left, but that's okay. Anyway, we're going to wrap up this series called Viral today. Um, remember that key verse that we started with in this series is from Mark 16, verse 15, and we'll read through that real quick. Um, it says that, he said to them, as Jesus saying to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to all creation. You can see from that verse that that the spread of the gospel, the spread of the love of Jesus Christ was intended to go viral right from the start. And we are employed with one purpose, and that is to take the gospel of Jesus viral. And so if you are a Christ follower today, that is your one purpose. All the rest of your, your purposes in life you know, come from that purpose. And so how we parent is based on taking the gospel of Jesus viral. That, that's another nice way to say make disciples. How we function in society, how we parent, how we, um, uh, how we live in marriage together. All those pieces is us taking in the gospel of Jesus viral, being employed with that one purpose. Last week I talked to you about grace, um, and we're going to kind of talk more about grace today. Specifically, last week was about the grace that we don't understand. Um, the grace that we receive from Jesus should go viral, but we really struggle to accept that grace that we don't understand. In other words, it's very hard for us to accept something that we don't understand. And then, it's really hard for us to share something that we don't accept because we didn't understand it. Let me start off this thing on an uncharacteristically heavy, heavy note. So instead of some funny story about my kids or whatever, I've, I've been, by the way, I've been banned um, from my oldest daughter about talking about her and uh, puberty anymore, and specifically her smelling like onions. And so I'm not allowed to say anymore that my um, soon-to-be tween uh, smells like onion sometimes, so I'm just going to keep saying it now to get it out of my system. No, I'm not, I'm not allowed to say it anymore. So I want to start on an uncharacteristically heavy note, and I want to ask you some questions. I really want you to think through these questions, because um, maybe it'll help us set the tone for the rest of the message today. What is the closest you've ever become to being accepted unconditionally? What's the closest you've ever come to being accepted unconditionally? Knowing that someone loves you and accepts you for exactly who you are. What mistakes have you made in your life trying to find acceptance? What mistakes have you made in your life trying to find acceptance? Try to think through these as we ask them. Don't worry, I'm not going to make you tell me or raise your hand or anything. How does, here's a couple more, how does insecurity drive you? Let me rephrase that. Um, how do you see your need for security playing out in the way you approach relationships? How has your search for security led you to do some things that actually made you less secure? So how has, you, how have, how, how has your search for security in things actually ended up doing the opposite and it's made you be less secure? Let me ask a few more. Do you carry around in your heart a basic sense of being worthwhile or a basic sense of being worthless? So do you walk around carrying around this sense of being worthwhile, or do you carry around this sense of being worthless? And then to go along with that, where does your sense of being worthwhile come from? Does it come from who you are, or does it come from what you do? Do you get more of a sense of being worthwhile, meaning that you matter, from what you do, or what you fail to do, or who you are? Um, the answers to those questions are not very comfortable to think about. Matter of fact, I found myself on a few of those being quite uncomfortable at the answer to them. Um, specifically, that last one, do you carry around in your heart a basic sense of being worthwhile or a basic sense of being worthless? Um, that's one that I've struggled with a lot in my life, which doesn't even seem like it makes sense. But I do struggle with that question. And, and the answer to these questions are really uncomfortable. There's a reason that they are uncomfortable. There's a reason they bring up so much emotion so quickly, and that's because they're centered on three of the deepest needs that the human being has. <clears throat> Men probably aren't going to like this discussion to begin with because we're going to talk about deep needs that the human being has. And we all try to, as men, we try to be you know, tough and act like we don't need it. 
Let me kind of tell you what they are. Number one is to be accepted. Look, we're either looking for acceptance or we're constantly convincing ourselves that we don't need it. We're either, we're either actually walking around looking for acceptance or we're telling ourselves all the time, I don't need it. And you know folks that do that, and we've all probably done parts of this, although I think we usually fall more into one camp than the other. So, so those of us actually walk around looking for acceptance, that's usually what we do. And then some of us who want to deny that we need it, we tend to focus a lot on that. And so you know those folks, or maybe you've done it too, where you deny um, needing acceptance. You know, you, you say stuff like, well, I don't need nobody, right? Well, I can do this on my own. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a self-made person. Uh, I, don't, I don't need that friendship. I don't need those people. All I need is me, you know. That, that, that's just a denying of the need for acceptance. We're either looking for a relationship, we're looking for a relationship with a person who will completely accept us. All of us are constantly looking for relationships with people where they will give us total and complete acceptance. Being accepted is a basic, basic human need. Number two, Another basic human need is to be secure. We need to know that the person that loves us, <clears throat> that there's this person who loves us and who accepts us without condition, and that same person that loves us and accepts us without condition today will continue to love and accept us without condition tomorrow. That is called security. So it's not just being loved and accepted by somebody, but then it's also that second human need is to be loved and accepted by someone uh, today the same way you will be tomorrow and, and, on, and going forward. So it's, it's constant security in that. Security is something that we all crave and that we are all seeking all the time. Depends on where we're seeking it at, how we're trying to create our own security. But security is a basic human need that we all are craving and that we are all seeking all the time. Here's the third one, to be needed. We need to know that the person who loves us and accepts us without condition today will continue to accept us and love us without condition tomorrow and that we have some significance in our lives. In other words, that, that we have this need for significance, like that we know we matter, that we count for something, and that our being in the world is better than us not being in the world. We all need to know that we have some sort of significance in our lives. And so if we kind of look and recap those things, ex acceptance, security, and significance. We crave them, and we need them. We either spend our lives pursuing these three things, or we spend our lives pretending that we don't need them. Either way, our response to those three things determines how we live our lives. How we handle either seeking out acceptance, security, and significance, or telling ourselves we don't need it from people, or we don't need it in this world, or we get it from ourselves, or whatever it may be. Th that, that is how we spend our whole lives revolving around finding the, the answers to those questions or, or getting those needs met. And what's crazy about it is, is, is our deepest regrets and our most profound mistakes were mostly made as we pursued one of these three things. Isn't that true? Like, I can tell you, just reading those sentences, it's hard for me to get outside of my mind and my heart of what I personally struggle with. But I know that all my deepest regrets and all the ways that I have just royally screwed up have come because I have tried to pursue one or all three of those things, acceptance, acceptance security, or being significant. Last week, we looked at how grace is hard to understand because we are strangers to the way God loves. We are strangers to the way God loves us. It's something that is very strange. It is a mystery to us. And last week, I pushed you, I challenged you, that the only way you can get familiar with something that's unfamiliar is to get familiar with it, to spend time with it, to, 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 to learn it more. Because this grace is hard for us to understand um, because of God loves in a very different way. He gives us all his completely unmerited favor. He showers us with love that we could never, ever deserve. There's no part of us that deserves it. And that's so foreign to us, so we don't understand it. You know, like we said last week, our nature is not to just shower out love on people that don't deserve it. Our nature is to make people actually deserve it, or even earn it. You know how... You'll hear that phrase about respect. It drives me crazy where it says, you know, respect is not given, it is earned. 
I think that Jesus would probably disagree with that statement. I think in the life of the Christian, respect is given, even when it's not earned, because respect and love and grace for us are given to us even though it's not earned, right? You know, but, but not understanding something has a natural consequence. When you don't understand something, it's, there's a natural consequence there, because what happens is, is we struggle to accept the things that we don't understand. And so we struggle to accept stuff that we don't get, stuff that we don't understand. And so we struggle to accept the grace of God because we don't completely understand it. I set that up to you last week that, that the, the, the hardest part about it is, is that you're going to understand something that you're never really going to completely understand. And it's so hard for us to accept that, so hard for us to accept it in our life. That's just a natural consequence of not understanding. You know, this difficulty in accepting God's grace is not some sort of new problem. The difficulty in accepting God's love is not something that's new for, for human beings. Why don't you go ahead and turn with me to Psalm chapter 8, and here's where we're going to be tonight, uh, today, excuse me, we're going to be in John 8, we're going to be in, um, excuse me, we're going to be in Psalm 8, John 15, Ephesians 3, and 1 Corinthians 12. So we're going to kind of jump around a little bit, and so Bible app is a great thing to use today, or the screens, and you can follow along on my left and right, and you'll see that there. Um, but in ancient times, you'll see in Psalm 8, King David was actually thinking about, and talking about, and then writing about the way that God loves, and how not understanding it and difficulty accepting it is not something new. He was doing this way back then. He verbalizes it. If you go to Psalm 8, and we start off in verse 3, you'll see him say, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers. So in other words, when I start to think about these things of God, when I start to try to, when I try to, start to, try to understand them as a human, right? When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, verse 4, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? See this, this is a transition here to him seeing how big and crazy and amazing the world is that God made and then going, I don't actually understand though why humans, why people, why I matter to you so much. He says, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. Verse 5, you have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands and you put everything under their feet. David's sitting here trying to figure this thing out, right? He doesn't really understand God's grace and then because we don't understand it, it's kind of hard to accept it. It's kind of hard to, to accept something we don't get and don't understand. And as he reads, through, if you read through this, what he's saying is, is you made all this amazingly cool stuff and then for some reason you give grace to humans so much that you let us rule over all the cool things that you created. I don't completely understand it. Look, the, the Christian notion of a God of infinite grace is difficult to accept. It's very difficult really hard um christianity is the only religion in the entire world that has this acceptance of an infinite amount of grace from the father and it's really hard to accept that especially when you start to think about yourselves as some sort of mere human i want us to talk through these pieces today and i hope this will help you um i, I decided to take this this particular series like in a little bit of different direction over the last last week and then this week and I just want to talk about grace quite a bit because I think there's nothing in the world that's going to make the gospel go viral other than the grace of God. And we as Christ followers have to try to understand it as much as we can, but we have to accept this huge gift because you can't really give away something you don't have. If I asked you to, to write me a check for a million bucks, you couldn't do it more than likely because you don't have it. And it's the same thing with taking the gospel of Jesus viral, to, to, to take it to all the world, preach the gospel to all creation. We have to actually begin to be familiar with it and start to understand it as much as we can. But the big key piece here is to accept it. So I want to talk you through these three pieces um, and kind of relate them back to those human needs, those basic human needs, and show you that those, those basic human needs are in us for God to fulfill. No one else is going to fulfill those. And it's in those that we begin to see that this grace that we can actually accept, even though we can't completely understand it. So let's talk through acceptance a little bit. Because of Jesus, you are accepted. Let me show you John chapter 15, verse 16 real quick. 
John 15, 16. Watch what Jesus says. You did not choose me, but I chose you. I love the beginning of this verse. You didn't choose me, I chose you. you how, do, how I said this a couple weeks ago, I think like this. You didn't find Jesus, he won't lost. Jesus found you, you were lost, right? Your idea of having faith in God is not your idea. Faith in itself is a gift from God. Like you can't even have faith and believe without the gift of faith through God, if that makes any sense, right? And so you, di you did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my Father's name will be given to you. God reached out to you, accepted you, and loved you. He reached out to you, he accepted you, and he loved you at a time when you were helpless to reach back. That is real, true acceptance we find in the grace of God. Some of you aren't going to like this statement, especially the mamas in the room. Well, let's go ahead and say it. God and God alone has accepted you exactly the way you are. God is the only person, let's, if we can call him a person, he was a person when he was Jesus, so I guess we can. God is the only one, that's a better word, he's the only one that accepts you completely exactly the way you are. As much as I would love to say that we as parents model this, I think we model it a lot of times, but then there's these few things that we tend to, even if we don't say them out loud, pinpoint, nitpick, nitpick, look at about our children. You know, there's a whole lot of people where just now when I said that statement, God and God alone has accepted you exactly the way you are. He's the only one. You'd be like, no, no, my mama did. But you know how many people can't say that about their mama? You know how many people can't say that about their dad? If you really want to cut through it, God and God alone is the only one to accept you exactly how you are. So that basic need of human acceptance comes in the fact that God is the one that accepts you. You know, we, we waste a lot of um, life and time looking for acceptance. Do you remember those questions I read at the beginning? Let me, let me say a couple of them to you real quick. What's the closest you've ever come to being accepted unconditionally? I immediately thought of my mama or my wife. What mistakes have you made in your life trying to find acceptance? A lot. Because we're trying to find acceptance outside of this infinite grace that God gives us in his acceptance of us. Because of Jesus, you are accepted. And you've got to, even though it's hard to understand, you have to accept that. Let's look at the next one. Let's talk through security a little bit. Because of Jesus, you are secure. So because of Jesus, you are accepted. But then because of Jesus, you are secure. And you remember what I said earlier about security, right? It was that we need to know that this person who loves us and who accepts us without condition today will also love and accept us without condition tomorrow. And because of Jesus, you are secure in the fact that he accepts you and loves you today and he will not change in that tomorrow. God and God alone has promised not only to love you, but to never stop loving you. He's the only one. I know that pushes in on our human need to turn to our spouses and say, no, baby, that's not right. I promise to never stop loving you too. But there's a whole lot of people who have had spouses stop loving them. There's a whole lot of people who've had moms and dads and friends and you people that they never thought stop loving them, stop loving them. Heck, everybody in the room has been in a position where you had, you, th you had someone that you thought you had security in their love and their acceptance. And then eventually, that security went away. What you had one day did not translate five years down the road. God and God alone is the only one who loves you, but not only loves you, never stops loving you. Ephesians 3, let's turn there real quick. We're jumping all over the place, but that's all right. It's good for us sometimes. Ephesians 3, <clears throat> verse 16 through 19. Let me read this to you. We read this not this long ago. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Man, that's a good way to start reading scripture right there, to get that kind of promise, right? So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp, watch this, this is so good, you got to pay attention to this, to grasp how wide and how long and how high 
and how deep is the love of Christ. And to know that this love that, suppresses, that, that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. I want to read it again because we're going to talk about it quite a bit. I pray that out of his glorious riches may he strengthen you with, your pow- with power through his spirit in your inner being. So in your, you think about those deep-seated uh, needs of the human being, right? Your deep inner needs. That's what he's talking about right here. Those three basic needs to be accepted, to be secure, to be significant. And then you see him talking about that in your inner being, that would be the case. Look at 17. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love, being rooted in it, right? You're, you're being held together by it. It is, it is what is keeping you grounded in this world. It's not some fleeting acceptance and fleeting security of someone else, but it is of God's, and you're rooted in it. May have power together with all the Lord's holy people so that we can grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep the love of Christ is. And to know that this love that surpasses knowledge, in other words, you're not going to completely understand it, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. It's a great verse. It's saying we can experience this love even though we can't really hope to understand it. You can experience something that you don't completely understand, right? I think science proves that of us every single day that we walk around. Like, how many of you in, in, in here right now, you think you have a really, really good, complete, total scientific knowledge of gravity? Probably not that many of us, but we experience it all the time, right? I experience it a lot because I got more mass being pulled down than my gravity, but you know what I mean. We experience it a lot, but we don't completely understand the concept of it. That, that verse there is saying that we can experience love like that even though we can't really ever expect to understand it. In other words, you can't accept things that you don't completely get. God's love for us is wide. And we've got to use human terms now to talk through how wide his love is. His love is wide like you can't see across it from one edge to the other, like space. That's how wide his love is. I want you to get a good picture as we're going through this, right? God's love is long. You can't see to the end of it, like the Great Wall of China. I've got this weird bucket list thing, and I want to go see the Great Wall of China. I want to walk on the Great Wall of China. I don't really want to go to China, but I want to go see the Great Wall of China. Um, And so his love is long, like the Great Wall of China. So far, you can't see to the end of it. And then God's love is high, right? Right? It's high. Like you can't see to the top of it. Like standing at the foot of Mount Everest. You know when you're standing at the foot of Mount Everest, you're almost as far um, from the tip of Mount Everest up as you are from it uh, long ways. Like, so I don't know if it makes any sense. But <clears throat> you're almost the same distance you are from it vertically as you are from it horizontally. You can't even begin to see the top of it. That's how high it is. And then God's love is deep. You can't reach the bottom of it, like the ocean. You know how much technology and equipment and stuff we have now, and we still cannot reach the bottom of the ocean? Isn't that insane? The same thing with space. There's certain human structures like the Great Wall and the pyramids and those things that we still can't explain completely. There's only a very small amount of people that have reached the pinnacle of Mount Everest. I mean, just think about it. God's love is wide, it's long, it's high, it's deep. It's expansive beyond your imagination. And so hopefully what you got in your head just now was like this this moment where you were going, whoa, you know. You were like, wow, that's just so big. There's no way. I can't even understand something that's that's that big. Now I want to push you to get out of that for a minute and get away from that thought of, whoa, it's just too big. And I want you to to understand instead, when you see something that's that large, when you're trying to understand something that that is that expansive, that means that you are secure in it. That should give you your security right there. You are secure in God's love because of how tall and deep and long and wide it is. You're secure in it. There's nowhere you can go to get away from it. You can't run anywhere to get away from it. You are safe in it. You are secure in it because it is expansive more than you would ever know. 
more than we can fathom or imagine. And so it's just massive, it's huge, and that means you're secure in it. You can't run away from it. There's no place you can go hide to get away from it. There's no deep down, dark, nasty place in this world that you could walk into, and some of you have been there, that God's love's not in that space. It's everywhere, which means you're safe in it, you're secure in it. And that security that so many of you are chasing is not in that man you're dating. It is not in that home that you're paying for. It is not in your job. You know how safe and secure jobs are? You know how people thought the jobs were really, really safe and secure until about 2008? And then they started actually listening to the people who experienced it years and years before with the Great Depression and Recession. You're not going to find that security in that man that you're dating. Mamas, you will not find that security in your children. It's God's love is the only one that is so expansive that you can't ever run away from it. That's a security that you can get. And yet again, you see this, this part of this, right? Where it's still so hard to understand. But you can accept things that you don't completely understand. Lastly, significance. That's the need to be needed. Finally, because of Jesus, you are significant. This one makes my heart like flutter a little bit. You know, I sound like a little middle school girl when I said that. You know what I mean? Like it makes, this one makes me get little, little um, butterflies in my stomach or something. This whole, because of Jesus, I'm significant. Because I think I figured out or picked up on or maybe it's just easier for me to, to grab that, that Jesus accepts me, right? And that when nobody else accepts me or when I'm rejected by other people that he accepts and loves. And then the fact that that, that love is secure right? So even when other people have run out or run away or leave me or whatever it is, one day they love you, the next day they hate you, you know what I mean? That, that God's love is secure in that. And, and I love those two, but, but they don't really move me like this last one does. Because of Jesus, you are significant. Because of Jesus, let me say it for myself, I am significant. Let me show you 1 Corinthians, and this is a heck of a piece of scripture we're going to read. It's quite long. If you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we're going to look at verse 14. We're going to read all the way through 27. There's a lot here, right? I'm going to try to kind of read through it without stopping, but you know I don't have a good track record of that. 14 says, even so, the body is not made up of one part but many. So we're talking here about unity and diversity in the body of Christ, right? Even so, the body is not made up of one part but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body. It would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body, right? So just because one part of the body says, well, I don't, I'm, I'm a foot, I'm not a hand, I don't want to hang out with these people, does not mean that you stop being part of it. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. It's still part of the body, right? Make sense? Your eye just can't stop and form another country like Brexit or something. That doesn't happen, right? It just doesn't just say, well, I'm out of the European Union. It's still in the body union, right? It can't leave. <clears throat> if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? It's funny, just, I don't know how your imaginations work, but just stop and picture like an eye with legs. That's what I picture right now. It's kind of interesting, kind of funny. Looks like that guy on Monsters, Inc. or something. If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be, right? If they were all individual, then where would the holistic whole body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. Now watch, he's going to go further with this. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, and the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. We should have used this on um, racism week two weeks ago. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Well, this is interesting. And the parts that we think of think are less honorable, right? Which other means which, which also means the ones that we don't like to talk about very much. So think about the parts of your body that you really need, but you don't like to talk about, right? You know what I mean? We usually cover them up with clothes. We treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. 
while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it. Mm. So that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. You know this is true, that every part of your physical body has concern for all the other parts. That's why you can stub your toe and it hurts, but you can also slam your finger in the door and it hurts about the same. All the body is concerned with all the body. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Look at this last verse. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. He just did a whole lot of talking and teaching about the body of Christ, about the body in, in particular, in different pieces. And then he closes it out with, now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. When he says you are the body of Christ at the beginning, he's talking to a, a, a group an entire group of people. You are the body of Christ. Then he comes back to us as individuals in the second part and says, and each one of you is a part of it. That we're all a part of the body of Christ. Did you get that last verse? I hope you got that last verse. What it's saying is, is your significance. Only as you accept your part in the body of Christ does your part mean anything. Like it's nothing by itself. It is everything though as part of the body of Christ. That's where your significance is found. You don't find your significance alone. You find it in the body of Christ. You find it in this, in this what we call the body of Christ, also the church. That's where you find your significance at. In other words, your significance comes from what you are a part of, not from what you do. Your significance comes from what you are a part of. And that's pretty awesome. And that's what gives me butterflies, because I realize that it's not about me and what I can do, or my talents, or my lack thereof. It is me being part of this thing, this, this, this movement, this mechanism of glory to God in the form of the church body that is called to take the gospel viral. There's this movement that we're a part of. The body of Christ is what's doing Mark 16, 15. The body of Christ is doing it. And so... Big part I got to play or little part I've got to play. Armpit part or hand part. Doesn't make any difference. I'm still a part of it. And my significance comes and your significance comes from the fact that you are a part of Christ's body. You know, we're all familiar with the idea of a team. Michael Jordan, one of my favorite athletes ever, probably of a lot of people, he could have been a great basketball player even if he never went into the NBA and just played on the streets. He still could have been a great basketball player. But in the NBA, Michael Jordan's significance as a player, it came from the Chicago Bulls. The Bulls made him a champion. Now, I know you'll argue and say, no, he made them champions. Yes, he made them champions too. But they gave him the platform to be a star. They gave him the platform. They gave him the keys. They believed in him and gave him the, 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 the team to stand with. It was, his significance came because of who he was a part of, not because of him alone. Your significance as a human being comes from who God is and what he has done and wants to do in your life, not from you. And see, that, that need of, man, I, I, when I was reading through these questions and I got to this significant one to be needed, and I was like, we all want to know that us being in this world is better, us being in it than being out of it, and that, that we're needed for something. We matter. And man, I struggle with that all the time, that what I'm doing's actually mattered and that it's significant enough. And, and then God hits you with something like this, talking about the body, whereas you're not even, your significance is coming from being a part of it, being part of me, being part of what he's doing. That's where your significance is coming from. So even if your part is teeny in it, or if it's huge, whatever it is, it's still part of what he's doing. And all my significance is coming from there. It's not whether you get the promotion at work that you're looking for. And it's not whether or not your spouse praises you on some certain day of the week. It's not even about what you happen to think about yourself. Now, I have to say that one to myself quite a bit. My significance isn't even what I think of myself. All of that is completely irrelevant. 
and it's immaterial to the fact that God has this total acceptance of you and love of you. And then he provides that through this security of everlasting, unchanging, unending love that you can be secure in. And the significance that he gives you in your life because he created you, he loves you, he has given you a part to play in making a difference in this world. He is the team. He gives the platform. So all these other things that we come, we think about our significance coming from, you know, whether we got that promotion at work or whether we get praise from this person or, or even what we think about ourselves, it just doesn't compare. It's, it doesn't even matter compared to the fact that God gives you the platform to your significance. You are a part of his body. In other words, you are on his team. You get to put on his uniform. It's the most important label on a jersey or a uniform. It is not the back where the number and the name is. It's the front of the jersey that has the team insignia on it. That's the most important part. Because you can transfer names to different teams, but you can't change that team. Everybody is grounded by that team. And you can see this play out in sports. If I keep going with sports analogy today, you, you can see this play out. So while you may have five people on a basketball court playing at one time and another 10 on the bench, let's say you got 15, and they've all got their jerseys on with, the, with the, 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 the logo on the front and their own names and numbers on the back, right? But they're all branded and they're all team by that logo on the front, the team that they're on. But then just take a second and stop looking in at the team and start looking out at the greater team. Look at all the people that are, are attending. They got shirts on too with the same logo on the front. It's not just about those people playing in that particular game. It's everybody that's supporting the whole thing. Your significance comes from the fact that God has given you the platform, not from any of this other stuff that we try to get our significance from. Men, I'm telling you, if I can just speak to men for just a minute, this one's going to trip you up. Significance is going to trip you up. This need to be needed and, and need to be significant in life and accomplish something. And you're not going to find that outside of God. Ladies, what's going to trip you up is the security one. Security is going to trip you up. You're going to try to find security in all the things you can find security in. Security in your husband and those vows that you made. Security in the money that you have and how much the bank tells you you've got at the moment. And, and, and security in your home and all these things so you can provide and you can, you can do things for your family. That security is only going to come from God. All the rest of that stuff is fleeting. Man, acceptance. Acceptance is one of those things that you just have to understand. Or maybe you don't really understand it, but you start to grasp it. That there is nobody that will ever love you exactly the way you are, other than God. It's hard to grasp that. God's grace is hard to understand, so it's kind of hard to accept. If last week we talked about it being difficult to understand. This week, you got to know that it's hard to accept something you don't understand. So many people, especially, there'll be a bunch here today, because Union Church reaches a bunch of people like this. So many have so many regrets because they search for this ultimate significance and security and acceptance in other people. And what we forget about those other people is that they're searching for the same thing. How many regrets do you have because you looked into a person for love and acceptance Security and significance. How many, how many times did that lead to regrets? How about when you did the same thing with the company that you worked for? How about this one? How about when you put it in that church you attend? Now, I don't even like to say that one because I run a church. I have so many regrets because I looked for love, acceptance, significance, security in churches. 
which you know is really just looking for it in people, right? And because of that, I made a lot of mistakes, a lot of stupid stuff. And then when I got out of those stupid stuff, those stupid mistakes, I blamed them for it. But they were just people looking for the same stuff too. We close this thing out. We are employed, commanded with one purpose, and that's to take the gospel of Jesus Christ viral. That's our one purpose. The only thing that is going to make that even possibly believable to people is the grace of God. That's it. And so we got to get somewhat familiar with it, even if it's enough to say, I don't completely understand it, but I accept it. Because I don't really think that you can hand out something that you don't have. You, you can't give away something you don't own. You can't write a check for something that you don't have the money to cover it. You, you have to have it. But that doesn't mean you have to get it completely. Like, I, I accept the grace of God on my life and, and, and the love of Jesus Christ. I accept it so much, but the more that I accept it and walk with him, the further along I get. What you're going to think is that the pastor starts to understand it more as he walks further with it because we're reading it more and we're studying it more and I preach it like I understand it, right? Yeah, no, no, no. What I realize is the more I walk in the acceptance of it, the less I understand of it. And that's beautiful. Like, it's great that I begin to be floored over and over again of how is this possible? How is this possible? And I need to be reminded from time to time, like you do, uh, from that verse from 1 Corinthians, that it is not my piece of the body that's important. It is the whole body. I get my significance because of the whole thing that God's doing. We get our significance as a church, folks, as we take the gospel viral. Don't, don't, don't get it wrong. That's our job to do in our community. And we're going to do it better than anybody else can do it. But we get our significance because we belong to the whole church, doing that throughout the whole world. We are not special. We are chosen. We are not different. We have been loved, saved, redeemed. God has given, and he gives full acceptance through Jesus Christ. Because of Jesus, you are accepted. But also because of Jesus, you are secure in that acceptance. And then praise God, because of Jesus, you are significant. The most important thing you're ever going to be a part of is his church. You're not going to find anything else in this life that you'll be a part of that's more important than his church. Everything that happens in his church changes eternities. And so, taking that gospel, making that gospel go viral. It kind of begins and it ends with us accepting his grace. Let me pray with you this morning. As you're praying right now, I want you to just pause. I want to ask you those same questions I asked you before. And then I'm hoping that what you're going to do is you're going to, have see the, you're going to see the answer that you got and we're going to replace it with God's grace? What's the closest you've ever come to being accepted unconditionally? Knowing someone loves you and accepts you exactly for who you are. And what mistakes have you made in your life by trying to find that acceptance? Well, let me hear God say, I'll take that spot. I'll be the place where you can actually come and feel unconditionally accepted. And I'll take those mistakes you've made too trying to find it. Right here, right now. How do you see your need for security playing out in the way you approach relationships? Has your search for security led you to doing things that made you less secure? I want you to hear God say right now, you can search for security in your relationships with me. You can search for it in me. And those things that you've done that have made you feel less secure, don't you project that onto me. Because there is no end or no height. There is no depth that can be tracked to find the, the end of my love. There's no end to it. Do you carry around in your heart a basic sense of being worthwhile 
or a basic sense of being worthless. Well, you are worthwhile to Jesus. Hear him say that this morning. Hear him tell you you're worthwhile to Jesus. Where does your sense of being worthwhile, not being worthwhile come from? Does it come from who you are? Or does it come from what you do? I want you to hear Jesus squash this one right now. Your being worthwhile does not come from what you do. It does not come from what you haven't done. Right now as you pray, hear God tell you, it comes from who you are. And your identity, your primary identity as a Christian is you are part of God's family. Father, we pray to you right now, God, I pray that you'd open up hearts and minds and souls here today, Lord, and anyone watching online or wherever they may be, Lord, we pray for every single church around us preaching the gospel as well. Father, that we will hear you loudly and clearly, not only on your commands to us to love you and to love our neighbor and take the gospel viral, Lord, but we'll hear you, hear you clearly in, in the fact that you are the one that gives us acceptance, security, and significance. We need to be loved, God, as a human, and you love. We need to be secure as humans, God, and you are secure. God, we need to be needed. We need to have some significance. And in you and on your team, we find it. Lord, I pray that you just stir in hearts today. And then you move in this church. Then you would let us see that the only real way to take the gospel viral is for us to accept it and own it ourselves, even if we don't understand it. Lord, I pray that you will keep blowing our minds with your grace so much that we continue to accept it and not understand it. Till we meet you face to face one day, we have no clue. Just how big, just how wide and long and high and deep your love truly is. Lord, if there's someone here today that doesn't know you as their Savior, God, I pray that today would be the day right now that they would step into that real acceptance that comes from you. That when John 15, 16 said, you didn't choose me, I chose you that they would feel that right now. If that's you praying wherever you are, if you feel right now Jesus is choosing me, he's coming after me, he's pursuing me, you dag him straight he is, and all you have to do right now is accept him. Just put your trust and your belief and your faith in him right now. Just tell him, Jesus, I trust you. I believe in you. I put my faith in you. Anything like that. And he's going to shower on you more acceptance than you know what to do with. You love, you are loved, and you matter to God. Father, I pray that you'd save souls and then take us on this journey, God, where we just see bigger and bigger and clearer and clearer how much we don't know and how grand you are. We love you today, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.